now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother womb, mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at that gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms for those who entered the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him, with John, Peter said, Look it up. And so he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Verse 11. Now as the lame man who had healed, who was healed, held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. And so when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Verse 14. But you deny the Holy One and the just, and asking for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, who you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him his perfect, his perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brother, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he is thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so the times of your very threshing may come for the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ to preach to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. Verse 22, just a few more verses. For Moses truly said to his fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, like me from the brethren. Him you shall bear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets, from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are the sons of the prophets. And all the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, In your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up the servant Jesus, who sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. That's chapter uh, 3 of Acts. Tell me my water back there. You need what? Water. My water back there. Some water. I'll leave my water. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you. I thank you that uh, as men we get to dig into the work together, and I pray, Lord, that uh, even as I was reading through this, um, I thank you for the things that you were teaching me, the things that you were changing in my heart. And so I pray tonight for each one of these men, and myself included, Lord, that you speak into our lives so that our hearts are renewed, by your word, that our hearts are maybe sparked, maybe more of a spark than we've ever had. We continue to grow deeper in our understanding and our relationship with you. And may that, Lord, um, bring uh, just e even a fresh repentance to us. Help us to share and love on other people. And Lord, I pray that tonight I preach you, your son Jesus. I pray that the words that come out of my mouth are the things that you want me to say. And so anything that I have on my notes or anything that I'm prepared for, 
Lord, if you don't want me to say, I ask that you right here in the moment tell me not to do it. And if there's something that needs to be added, if there's something in here um, that a heart needs to hear, Lord, I pray that I say those things. Lord, let us all be um, just um, wooed by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word that you've given us to us so that we can come and know you deeper. And so I ask that you open up your word to our hearts and our hearts to your words. Thank you, Lord, for these things. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, so I, like I said, I was blessed. And I was blessed to hear uh, Tom teach. I was blessed to hear Steve teach. Uh, it's good that they took a lot of the context of Acts uh, and talked about the timetable. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, talk about the history of things that were going on. A lot of my stuff this evening is going to be a lot of application of things that's going on. We see uh, this is just recent, uh, right after the, uh, the time of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has been placed in the lives of believers. Uh, there's many miracles that's been happening. Uh, the disciples have watched Jesus do many things. And so we're going to get to see uh, Peter and John and look at him a little bit in depth of what their lives look at. So it's going to be a, a good time. So. I want, to, I want to talk about change. Um, as us as men, I, I can tell you personally, uh, I uh, was thinking about it the other day. I was talking to somebody. I was thinking about um, change. And I was thinking about how I am good with change. I was like, you know what? I'm, when something around the church changes, I feel like I'm good at change. I feel like I can take it. And so as I started to think about that, I realized um, maybe I'm, I'm not as good at change as I once thought. When something happens here, I was having a discussion with Chelsea, and uh, she was like, maybe I, I want to do so-and-so. And the first thing that came up was some negative thoughts. And I, and I kind of said to her, I said, uh, Chelsea, I just don't think that's a good idea. And I said, and she said, you know what, man, I need to tell you something. This is like the third time I've heard this this week, though, but it took my wife for me to receive it, right? She said, I want to let you know, every time I talk about change, you give me two negative comments. And then as we talk about it, then you're like, oh, yeah, baby, it's a good idea. And I, she said, you are terrible to change. And I got to think about the week where I'm going to the office and something changed here, and I go sit in the office of the DA, and I'm like, man, why are we doing that? You know? And I'm thinking about the things that I say, and I'm like, dang, man, I, was, I thought that I was really good at change. And the reality is, change is tough. Change is tough for each person. And so as I thought about Acts 3, I want to talk about all the things that the disciples are going through. Let's put our mind, and we're going to be talking about Peter and John. Let's just put our mind, let's wrap our mind around the history and the things that are going on with Peter and John. Because they've been walking with Jesus for three years, and Jesus is no longer there. They had, in their, probably in their pride and the things that we kind of think about, we can think about where John was wanting to sit at the right hand of Jesus, but in their pride, these men uh, would just knew that Jesus was coming to take over the kingdom. He was coming to restore Israel to the power here on earth that Israel deserved. So these men had all these things as they were following Jesus and receiving him. I wrote down everything that happened in three years. Not everything, but a lot of things. Jesus taught them. He ate with them. He prayed with them. He immersed them in the culture of being a disciple. The disciples watched as Jesus healed people with sickness, cleansed lepers, forgave sins, healed a paralytic, calmed the winds of the sea, Healed a demon-possessed man, restored the life of a girl, fed 5,000 people with some fat fish and loaves, fed 4,000 more just a few days later, <coughs> healed two blind men, predicted his death and resurrection, was transfigured in front of them on a mountain. All this stuff these two men seen. What you think about that? Raised Lazarus from the dead, entered Jerusalem on a donkey, turned tables over in the temple, Celebrated the Passover. Jesus is hung on a cross. The veil of the temple is torn. Jesus is betrayed by Jesus. Jesus goes before Pilate. He's mocked and beaten by soldiers. Then Jesus appears resurrected from the dead. Resurrected from the dead on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. Appeared again to his disciples. And then they watched as Jesus ascended into heaven. Now I'm thinking about changing my own life. But I'm thinking about three years of that. That's a lot for a disciple or for any person to experience. And now to be without Jesus. 
I mean, they're without Jesus. We're talking about 50 days from the time that Jesus ascended. They spent three years of their life with him, watching miracles, watching things happen. And I think about, uh, personally, a story about me coming to work here. So I came to work here. I've been, um, I got married in September of 2014. These are the things that happened since September of 2014. Changed jobs. Was in the car business. Left the car business. Come to work here. The week that I came to work here, uh, uh, we got into a collision. The first service. Only had to give up my company car. So we had Chelsea's car. Chelsea would all week would tell me, hey, baby, be careful with the car. Be careful with it. It's our own car. A week into a new job, bang, the truck pulls out in front of us. Totals the only car that we have. Now we have zero cars. I say, what the heck? Chelsea, let's have a baby. We don't really trust the Lord. Let's really do this. Let's do it. We don't do it. We don't need that new car. Well, she found out a week later she was pregnant. This is all the stuff that happened within a year. I was ordained as an elder. So lots of changes. Lots of things in my life. And so I think about when we think about the disciples and when we read through the scripture, I want us to think about all the changes that were happening. And all the changes that happen in our lives and how we deal with that. How do, how do you deal with change? How do each of us handle change in our lives? Luke 6, 46-49 says, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you who he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation of the rock. And when the flood rose, the stream beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it, for it was found in the rock. But he who heard and did nothing was like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, immediately fell, and the woman of the house was great. This is uh, Jesus' words, and he's sharing with his disciples. And I think about as life happens, change happens, how just about change in our lives will come, but we are called to stay rooted in Jesus. Change in our lives will come, but we are called to stay rooted in Jesus. Guys, things are going to change, things are going to happen, but it's up to us to stay rooted in Jesus and the faith that we have, the Word of God, and live by the Spirit of God, and continue seeking and turning towards the Lord. Any of the things that's happened with the disciples, specifically not seeing Jesus and Jesus ascending into heaven and then not having him anymore. Think about how it felt at the day of the resurrection. They seen their king being beaten. They seen the guy that they thought that was going to restore Israel being mocked by soldiers. Soldiers, when they seen him hung up on the cross, I think about the defeat that was in their head. And I think about things that happen in our life as men that will just completely destroy some men. But if we're rooted in Jesus, if we're rooted in the foundation of Christ, Continue pressing into Jesus, and then God changes your life and bring blessings on the other side. So let's start in Acts. Acts 3. Here we go. Now Peter and John went together to the temple at the hour of prayer to night time. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. To ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at it. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Think about that. I think about how many times we are asked to serve other people. How we're asked to help other people and to be a, a minister and to, um, and this is what happens. This is what I see. I see people coming into the church a lot. And I see them asking for boxes of food or help them with benevolence. And we all run into those, those times where we need help. And oftentimes it's easier for us to give somebody some money than to actually extend our hand in grace and serve them for the need instead of the want. Because a lot of times people come in or we see people on the streets. I think it's really cool that we see that 
uh, Peter and John are doing ministry outside of the church, not just inside of the church. They, weren't, they didn't just go to the church and preach and stay in there. But they are on the way to the church and they're walking in ministry. And here's somebody who needs help and is asking for something they want, thinking that's what they need. But Peter and John respond with the need and not the want. So I think I'm looking at these guys and I'm like, let's look and see who Peter and John are. Let's look at them. All right, we got Peter here who has just recently preached a sermon. You heard last week, preached a sermon. 3,000 people gave their lives to the Lord. 3,000 people had a sermon. And we look at this guy and we're like, all right, well, who is Peter? So we turn back to John 18, verse 10 and 11. It says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Jesus is being betrayed. Here this Peter is and just told somebody to rise up and walk. But here before, he's over here cutting people's ears off in the name of Jesus. Hey, Jesus, I don't want you to be attacked. I'm going to cut somebody's ear off. I mean, I mean he's kind of gangster. I mean, let's be honest. Man. He's got a sword out. He's doing what Peter does. He wants to... He wants to protect Jesus. And so this is the Peter who now tells a, a man who is lame to rise up and walk. That's a big difference in the character of Peter, remember, in such a short time. It's three and a half years. All of a sudden, Peter's this guy who's telling him, I, that, would, that would be a fearful thing for me. To look at a man and go up and say, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And a couple years earlier, Peter's cut, not even a couple years early, matter of fact, this is pretty recent when Peter's trying to cut somebody's ear off. Let's look more at Peter. Matthew 26, 69 through 75 says, Now Peter sat outside on the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with the Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do, not know, I do not know what you're saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know this man. And a little later, those who stood by came and said to Peter, Surely you're one of them. Your speech betrays you. And then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately the rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept very bitterly. All right, here's Peter again. The man who tells a man to rise up and walk, and he's denying the Christ who he's using in his name. This is Peter. What's happening with Peter? That's the question. What's happening in this time frame? Let's do one more. You ready? John 21. Most surely I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself up and walked where you wish. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by the death that he would glorify God. This is a little different, man, but I, I really enjoyed seeing this. And when he had spoken this, he said to them, Follow me. And then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple who Jesus followed, loved, followed, who also had leaned on the breath at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrayed you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren that his disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if I, remain, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? Oh, Peter, the man who said that Jesus helped him to rise up the wall. His gospel. Hey, what about this dude? Even communicate the words of Jesus inaccurately. I gotta hear what Jesus is saying. He's gospel. He's selfish. He's a gossip. He's denying Christ. He's cursing, and he's quick to act. This is Peter. But yeah, right here in the moment, Peter's saying, "Rise up the wall." Well, let's look at John. Peter and John are constantly in the scriptures, getting at each other. It's, it's, it's hilarious. Matter of fact, the only time that the uh, that they talk about the ear being cut off is in the book of John, none of the other gospels. Um, even talk about it. It's just a, another fact that uh, John and, and Peter uh, like to mess around with each other. Uh, and these are the disciples, so we can be encouraged for sure. Mark 9, uh, 
this is John. Let's look at John before, before this moment. It says, Now John answered and said, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name. And we forbade, forbid him because he does not allow us. But Jesus said, Do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards be evil. For he who is not against us is on our side. Whoever gives a cup of water in my name, because, because you belong to Christ. Surely I say to you, you will by no means lose his reward. So this is basically what's happening with God. Here. My church is better than your church. That's it. That church down the road, that's what John is saying. They don't know what they're doing. They need to get up, come on up and get under our leadership. And Jesus is like, what are you, what are you talking about, man? What are you talking about? If anybody is working a miracle in my name, then allow them to work a miracle. And so this is the characters. These are the characters that we're looking at here in uh, Acts 3. Let's look again for a couple more things with uh, John. Luke 9 says, Now came to pass, when the time had come to him who had received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was not set to the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire down from heaven to consume them? Just as Elijah did. But he turned and rebuked them and said, do not know, You do not know what manner of spirit you were. But the Son of Man did not come to destroy man's life, but to save him. And they went to another village. So here's Peter and John working a miracle in the name of Jesus. And at this moment in time, just a little bit, Earlier in history, John is trying to call down fire from heaven because somebody's rejected Jesus. All right, Jesus, but I think about my own life. I think about how many times I've rejected Jesus. I know we can't in the room. How many times have you kind of done that? I mean, no grace here with John. He's just ready to call fire down from heaven. All right, let's look again. Mark 10. Here's the last one. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. He said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us that we may sit on your right hand and on your left in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? And be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And he said, We are able. And Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with baptism, baptism I am baptized with you, will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it is for very. Prideful, no grace, and forbidding other people to talk about Jesus. I mean, these are the two men that we're looking at in the Scripture. It's not long. It's not a lot of time for these men to be chasing. What is it? What is it? Why, why are they so changed? What is the difference between Peter and John then and Peter and John now? Acts 1 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The day of Pentecost. Jesus ascended and said, I'm going to leave a teacher with you. And it would be better for you to have this teacher than live inside you as the Holy Spirit. And our lives are different because of it. And the reality is this, this contrast that you see with Paul and Peter, I mean, Peter and John, and with it, and the, it's the same contrast you see in our lives. The same Holy Spirit that was given to Peter and John is given to us to do the work. Think about all the changes of the men in this room. I, I think about um, Zach. I think about seeing God rest, uh, uh, restore him to this place as he had left the church for a season. And he's coming back and he's submitting uh, to the leadership here. And I see him growing. I see him given of himself. I see him sacrificial. And there's only one thing that can do that. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Which was given to Peter and John. And it's given to us now. Life lesson. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to make a difference in the lives of others. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to make a difference in the lives of others. I was listening to it teaching um, the other day and uh, last night I got I was actually preparing to, to share with the young adults and we were actually talking about giftings and walking in our giftings understanding our giftings and kind of uh, really felt led to do that along with some conversations that I've had with some deacons and, um, and 
pastor's heart to make sure that we're equipped to know what's going on in our lives and uh, what the Holy, how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. And, uh, and I listened to the teaching I thought it was really good. And he used this verse, 1 Peter 4, 8-11, through says, And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover, cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, as each one has received a gift. Minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with all ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, and you belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. It says, be good stewards of the gifts that God has given us. God has uniquely gifted every man in this room. He has uniquely gifted every person in this room. Not just in spiritual gifts, but practical gifts. I can't build a wall. I can't. I'm not a woodworker. I'm not a carpenter. Carson is. Carson can build anything. He can build Ark of the Covenant. I know he can. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's coming. <laughs> And God asked us to steward the gifts that we have. He says, I'm going to give these things to you. I was talking to a, a, a deacon the other day, talking about the gifts that we have. And sometimes, I was talking to the, you know, the young adults about it last night. And how oftentimes we don't think about the, our own gifts. We don't, we don't look in ourselves and question what God's doing in our own life. It's kind of, um, one, one deacon said, uh, it's kind of like, Doing our own job interviews. You know, like we're looking at our own gifts and we're, we're looking at them and we're kind of doing, we're, we're looking at ourselves and figuring out what it is. But the reality is, again, it's nothing in you. It's what God's given you and equipped you with. So when we're looking at our gifts and we're trying to recognize what those gifts are in our lives, we're giving God glory for the things, the work and the things that He's given us in our lives. There's nothing that we're looking at ourselves. Man, God is. Give to so and so with this, so and so with that. That's that's it's the gift that God gives us, it's placed inside of us for us to recognize and then give glory to God by using it to build and benefit his kingdom. So what are you doing with your gifts? <coughs> what gifts do you have and how are you walking in? First Corinthians 12. There are diversities of gifts, but of the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, and to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, and to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works for all these things, distributed to each one individually as He wills. And so when we look into the Word, we think of spiritual gifts and the gifts uh, through the Holy Spirit. And then when we get saved and God has equipped us physically with the things that we're gifted in, and, um, you know, like uh, I, was, I was telling young adults last night, like, I'm gifted administrator, okay? So I, I can uh, write a Word document and send it out to 12 people and keep up with the task list of things. It's not my favorite thing in the world to do, and a lot of times I fight it. I don't want to sit behind a desk and do a bunch of Word documents and send a bunch of emails. That's not exactly what I want to do. But I'm fighting the gifts that the Lord has equipped in me. And so what I have to do is think outside of myself and say, you know, I kind of, you can kind of back up. This is the way that God's equipped me. And I want to use those to benefit the kingdom. I used to benefit a car dealership. Maybe God millions and millions of dollars. And now God's given me the ability to come in here and use those administrative gifts to help build the church. Now I can deny those gifts because I don't really like them. And I can step aside and allow somebody else to be raised up into that area. Or I can listen to the Lord, receive the gift that He's given me, and walk in and benefit everybody around. And we all have that choice in here. We all have this choice. And then we look at the spiritual gifts. I, 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 I remember a time where um, I got a word of knowledge. 
and it scared the crap out of me. I got a burden off, so I got, I got to go tell this guy something. And I called this guy up on the phone, and uh, talking to him on the phone, I said, man, I, I got to tell you something. I was so nervous, man. I, 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 had, I didn't have a shirt on to my house. I was walking, it was like 11 o'clock at night in the summer. I was out in front of my house in the driveway. Uh, I got my belly all hanging out. I got some gym shorts on. I'm talking to this guy on the phone. And I'm like, man, I got this word of knowledge I need to share to you. And uh, I share it with him. And as I'm telling him, it's an intimidating word, you know. But it's a word to benefit him. Um, and so I, I share it with him. And, he's, and he confirms it. And at this time, I, I'm crying. I'm like, let me, I need to pray with you with it. You know, so now I'm crying. I don't even know what's happening. This gift, I've never seen it before. I'm going to do with it. So I'm crying, I'm sharing with him, we're praying. And I'm thinking about how all that is for me to step out on faith on a spiritual gift that God's given me to walk in. And as we continue to take a step of faith, I remember one time I, I was uh, I had a word of knowledge from Carson. I went up to the altar and said, Carson, man, this might sound stupid, but I need to tell you what I gotta tell you. Carson confirmed me, it was right, and said, never feel, never feel awkward coming up when God gives you a word of knowledge. Encourage me, confirm me in it. You remember that, Carson? It was a blessing. Sure. <laughs> and so as we continue to see God, ask God for these spiritual gifts that He's placed and He's divided into the body of Christ and given them to us. And we ask God what those are and God confirms those things into them and we step out of faith and continues to embolden, embolden us into those giftings. And we can walk with those giftings just like Peter and just like John has in the Scripture in Acts 3. Now, if we look at all these giftings and we think about all the things that we do and we don't walk these things out in love, which is what 1 Corinthians 14 says, I do want to share with you John 15 that it says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servant. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. I have called you friends. For all things that I've heard from your Father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit, fruit should remain. And that whatever you ask the Father in my name, He may give you. These things I command you that you love one another. When we realize our giftings and we use them for the body of Christ, we are blessed and people are blessed around us. It's just a beautiful thing to see at work, man. I had a phone call today. It's kind of just... I had a guy who's sitting there talking to me, and so we ended up having a conversation. He's talking about his giftings and how God's raising him up at work and how he's able to witness. And uh, He called, in fact, to pray for us. I ended up getting to pray for him, which is very rare for me to get on the phone and do that. And he's getting on the phone, man, he's super encouraged. I'm super encouraged. Everybody's super encouraged. And he's like, man, I'm going to tell you something, man. I pulled up here to my work site and seven guys standing out here watching me. He says, because I sat here and got to pray with you, I'm going to get out. I'm going to be able to get out of this car and witness because they're all asking me why I've got my eyes closed sitting in front of my truck. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, man, that's just how what God does, man. That's just how cool God is, man. He ordains conversations and gives us times when we step out of faith and we talk to people and we Walk in our spiritual giftings and God uses us for the benefit of the church. Use them, it uses them for the benefit of the unbelievers. Let's continue on. Acts 3. Let's see what happens with this miracle uh, with um, Peter and John. Acts 3, verse 7. He said, He took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with him, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I said it earlier, I want to say it again. Remember, these men were not in the temple. And I think that it's important the life lesson is we are not called to just do ministry at the church. We're called to do ministry in our families, friendships, and our workplaces. When we see this, miracles happen. We are not called to just do ministry at church. We're called to ministry in our families, friendships, workplaces. Acts, we're going to continue on in Acts, Acts 3, verse 11. It says, Now the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John. All the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. And so when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why 
do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power of godliness we have made this man walk? Our lives should give glory to God, not ourselves. It could have been easy for Peter and John to be like, yeah, see this miracle I just did? Could have popped a collar, <laughs> dust, dust their shoulders off. Could have said, anoint me, put me in a position, give me some more power. Because that's really what the world says now. If I'm good at something, it's really to raise me up for my own benefit. Um, but we're not called for our own benefit. We're called to do the works of Jesus for the glory of God. Um, we're going to continue on the next. Verse 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, and he delivered up, denied in the presence of Pilate. This is Peter and John's, Peter's words with their expression, their response. When we had determined to let him go, but you denied the Holy One. And the just asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead of which we are witnesses. And in His name, through faith in His name, has made this man strong. And you see in the... Yes, the faith which comes through Him has been given Him this perfect sound in all presence of all of you all. Hey, Zach, I'm going to skip that next one. You'll have to hit through it, but I'm not going to, I was going to go through the um, solos, um, the five solos, but I'm going to skip on. We're going to go on to verse 17. It says, Acts 3, 17 says, Yet now, brother, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. Think about how many times what they could have said to these men. Right? These men experience, these people that were around them, experience the the death of Jesus. They were there. He could have easily said, you fools, you idiots, you killed Jesus. I mean, he did say that in a way, but, he, but then he comes around and he says, I know you did it in ignorance. He gives them the grace card. Right? He says, I know, I know you did it. And I know politically correct, we say ignorance kind of a mean word. But when we don't know something, that's exactly what we are. We're ignorant. We're ignorant in it. We have ignorance. And so he said, I, I know that you did it in ignorance. He corrected them in love and in grace. I think we forget that uh, Romans 2, 4, and uh, Zach, this is going to be out of order, so just don't worry about it. It says, uh, Or you despise the riches of goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. We can go out and we can throw a Bible at anybody. We can beat anybody up with the Word of God. I, I mean, I see it all the time, man. We just... Man, you sinner, you're going to hell. You know, it ain't gonna do it, bro. I have never seen that come on the other side of somebody say, "Oh my gosh, you threw a Bible at me. I need to get to church. I, I need to get to church." But you made me excited to come to church with you. I'm so excited. Thank you very much. Never seen. It. I, I, I oftentimes see uh, Christians, and, and, I, and I use social media because I see it. Uh, I. I always see people casting blame on people on Facebook. Like unbelievers. Can you believe this guy did this? Or using the article or something and saying, what an idiot. And I'm sitting there thinking, what kind of example is that? That person sees that? Are they really going to come to Christ today, guy? I remember one time I was convicted of uh, something that a dealership I used to work at, and I knew the Lord was really laying on my heart. I remember that morning praying about not doing it. And uh, the Lord told me not to do it anymore. And uh, I got to work, and I'd done it all day. It's about 5 o'clock. It's about, about time to leave. And I said, and I went and did it again. I was a little mean to somebody. And the Lord had convicted me of it already and told me not to do it. And the guy said, I'll tell you what. And they used to call me pastor at this this place. They'd be like, oh, oh, there's no pastor because I have a Bible and I'm going to read and I'm going to let them listen to a teaching or I'm going to play some worship music for them. And so that's what they always tell them. And, uh, and it's like a joke, a mean joke. And it was like a lie. And that's what the Lord was telling me I did. And uh, at the end of the day, I did it. And I remember thinking about when I did it, I should not have done that. And that guy said, I'll tell you what, man, you the. Uh, Lines, Pastor, I, know. I tell you what, if I come to Jesus, it won't be through you. Now, this guy was joking. 
He was joking with me. He was just really just picking around with me like I was picking with him. But immediately, that rooster crowed like it did with Peter. And I was like, dang, the Lord told me not to do that. And I think about how many times that we can be and drive meanness to think that people's going to come to the, to the Lord. And how many times we turn people away from Christ instead of drawing them near. Remembering that it's the goodness of Christ that draws people to repentance. It's not, it's not being mean. It's not hitting them with the Bible over the top of their head. It's loving them. On. It's buying them a cup of coffee. It's not casting blame. But they're not believers. They're, they're going to do unbelieving things. Their moral compass is not set on the foundation of the Word like ours. They're not going to do the same things. We can't expect believers. And then what do we do with believers? What do we do with the people in this congregation or the people that we see that maybe not, not understand fully, maybe not talk the word or understood it? Do we correct them in rudeness? Do we condemn them? The Bible tells us clearly there's no condemnation in Christ. Galatians 6 says, I don't know if you're still there. Uh, you may have skipped it. I don't know if you can go back. Galatians 6 says, Brethren, if a man is undertaken to trespass, you are spiritual, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. I'm sure Peter and John could have thought of themselves as something. I'm sure they could condemn these people. But they mentioned. I understand that you did this in your ignorance. I'm giving you another shot. I'm giving you another shot to know Jesus. We've done some wrong things in this room. But I sure wouldn't say crucify him and bring me to prison. I might have done some things, but the men that were standing here that Peter and John were talking to were the same men that were present at the crucifixion of Christ. And Peter's looking at them and he's saying, I know you did it in ignorance. God wants to give you one more chance. God wants to give you one more chance. That's encouraging to me. Sorry, I lost my notes right here. We got the law of track. Life lesson. We're called to extend grace to others. It's the grace of God that draws people to Jesus. We are called to extend grace to others. It's the grace of God that draws us to Jesus. Acts 3, continuing on with the story, verse 18. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets. That the Christ would suffer. He asked us to feel. Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that He may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of His holy prophets since the world began. Verse 22, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things whatever He says to you. And it shall be that your every soul who will not hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, all the prophets, from Samuel and those who have followed, as many have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are the sons of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in all your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you, and turning away everyone from you. Every one of you from your name. Really what we see here is we see the gospel portrayed out in a wonderful chapter. We see men's lives being changed, a miracle happening because of their faith. We see people being drawn to Christ. We ask, see repentance being asked for. And so we see the gospel being presented through um, the book in the, the chapter of Acts 3. And so I think about that. I think about what is our response? What is our response to that? What shall we do with it? Maybe everybody in here is a believer. And now we're trying to deepen our walk with the Lord. And we see this. And we see them walking in giftings. 
We see them trusting the Holy Spirit. We see them empowered like any of us would be. I seen today that I was talking about anointing and I was thinking about being anointed with the Holy Spirit and, and said that um, anointing, what they would used to do with sheep, would lice and insects would get onto the sheep. And so the lice would bear, uh, bore down into the sheep's ear and would kill the sheep. And so the only way to keep the sheep in power and protected and sealed would be soaking with oil. And so when you soak the sheep with oil, the lice would slip off and the insects would slip off. So instead of the sheep dying, they'd be empowered and they'd be covered with the Holy Spirit. Well, covered with the oil. And in the same way that happens to us when we're anointed with the Holy Spirit, we're covered, we're protected, and we're empowered. And so each one of us has a response to make tonight. Anytime we're in the Word, we get, we get presented the Scripture, and what are we going to do with it? Are we going to look for our giftings? Are we going to press in? Are we going to allow things to happen that's change that's going to get us shifted? Are we going to build our house on the rock? Are we going to continue pressing forward, continue pressing in, and continue following Jesus? I think it was cool. Back in chapter 2, Peter shares this awesome message and it says this in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you, after God, shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Every day, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves and then ask ourselves what we're going to do about it. The cool thing is that we got a living and active God that wants to speak into our lives. Every moment of the day, God wants to speak to us. He wants to change our hearts. He wants us to learn about Him. I don't know about you guys, man, but I love getting to the Word. I love it, man. There's nothing sweeter than to hear God speaking in my life to His Word. Man, you can take any baseball game, Take any marathon. You can take anything in my life that happens. But when I hear a word from the Lord, there is no more joy. And my joy cannot be any more full. Yeah. And God calls us that same thing when we get into the Word. And we should respond. And the reality is the Gospel requires a response. So if you don't respond in the positive, you respond in the negative. But you are responding. Let's pray. God, thank you.